festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to the first session of day two. On behalf of JLF Colorado Festival co-directors Namita Gokali and William Dalrymple, Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library, City of Boulder, and the Boulder Arts Commission, we welcome you to this session. Welcome to Synthesis with Laylee Long Soldier and Jennifer Forster. Leading U.S. poets Laylee Long Soldier and Jennifer Forster offer selections from their work, followed by conversation examining their craft and their subjects. Their poetic craft synthesizes diverse and hybrid poetic forms as they examine their reflections on synthesizing their native and U.S. identities, cultural knowledge, and ways of being on this earth. <clears throat> First, we will uh, turn to Laylee Long Soldier. Laylee Long Soldier holds a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and an MFA from Bard College. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, The New York Times, American Poet, The American Reader, The Kenyan Review Online, Bomb, and elsewhere. She is a recipient of an NACF National Artist Fellowship, a Lannan Literary Fellowship, a Whiting Award, and was a finalist for the 2017 National Book Award. She has received the 2018 Penn Jean Stein Award and the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award. She is the author of Chromo Summary and Whereas. Please warmly welcome Laylee Long Soldier. Over to you, Laylee. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, I'm so happy, I'm so honored to be with you this evening. And thank you to all that are joining us. I wish that we could be together in person, but I'm so grateful that we can still come together in this way. Um, I'm going to share some work that tonight, just a few pieces, just two pieces uh, that came from, I also work visually. So it comes from some visual work I did a few years ago, um, but I often like to work uh, with uh, projects that where I can combine text with my visual work. So I'm gonna share a few uh, images of that work and then read the pieces. Um, can you see, I have it on screen share, can you see it? 
Yes, okay. Uh, so the title of the exhibit, it was a group exhibit with two other people, two other artists, Lakota artists, uh, titled Midakoye Oyasin. And in our language, that roughly translates to something like all my relatives or we are all related. Um, This is a quick picture of the process, the construction process. I know that um, Jen and I intend to talk a little bit about process tonight. So this was the beginning stages of that uh, visual work on my kitchen table. Uh, this, it's hard to tell, but this is a six foot square uh, diamond sewn together with um, copper wire. And this is the finished piece. Um, these two pieces measure 12 feet high by 12 feet wide. The little dots you see in the middle or along the piece is those are that's actually text that was laser cut into the paper. Um, so I'm going to share two pieces from two of these sections tonight. Oh, that's that's the multicolored one. And here's a few other pieces from the exhibit. These are the two other artists, uh, Mary Bordeaux and Clementine Bordeaux that I uh, collaborated with. As I hope to speak, my heart, I remember to sing as a child, to understand these our stories. As I hope to change my tongue, I long to sing as a child, to understand these our stories. As I hope to change my eyes, I pause to sing as a mourner to understand these are stories. As I cease to believe my eyes, I pause to sing as a mourner to endure these are stories. As I cease to believe my intuition, I continue to sing as a soldier to endure these our stories. As I cease to believe my intuition, I forget to sing as a soldier to endure these our stories. As we reach out mindful of forgiveness. We shift our anger as a cadence vibrating the cellular. As we reach out in the presence of trust, we face our anger as a cadence vibrating the cellular. As we reach out in the presence of betrayal, we cry our anger into an echo vibrating the cellular. As we retaliate in the presence of betrayal, we roll our anger into an echo, uncaging the cellular. As we retaliate because of history, we pound our anger into a flood, uncaging the cellular. Wopila, thank you. That's it. Oh, thank you, Laylee. Just amazing, thank you. Just really profound. 
Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Elise Forster. Jennifer received her PhD in English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver and her MFA from Vermont College of the Fine Arts and is an alumna of the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is a recipient of an NAA Creative Writing Fellowship and was a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford. Forrester currently teaches at the Rainier Writing Workshop and is a literary assistant to US Poet Laureate Joy Harjow. She's the author of two books of poetry, Leaving Tulsa and Bright Raft in the Afterweather, and served as the associate editor of the recently released When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through a Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry. Daughter of an Air Force diplomat, Forrester grew up living internationally, is of European and Muscogee descent and is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. Please warmly welcome Jennifer Elise Forrester. Jennifer. Peace, Jay. Thank you, Mado. Thank you, Jesse, for inviting me to read. And thank you, Laylee, for having me read with you. Um, and thank you to the whole team of uh, Jaipur Literature Festival. I was so lucky to be able to attend in person in Boulder a few years ago and several years in a row and, and to meet some of you there. Um, I'm so happy that, you're, that we're still together. So I'll begin. Paradise. We carried the swifts in wheelbarrow loads from factory windows, chimneys, lit our fires with peat, our backs to the murmuring forest. After the rain, dust motes, ghosts in a glade of shade pine. Now we no longer know the names for flowers, cannot unfurl them, nor the stars coils. We flare in heaven's refinery, raise our smoldering flag. Canyon. Brush over stars, dust, upthrust, shale, erosion stripped, script of ledges, sloughing scales off our hands, finned imprints, slow aging metamorphic skins, quartz, schist, gypsum, marine bones bedded in the drainage. The basin overflows with wind, horizon, Phantom barges ashore once lush with cane. Moon, a relic in the azure sky, gray face cut from the mountain spine. A line of dust divides us, narwhal and ghost. Ancient stream whose sound remains, floodland, arroyo, yucca. Sawaro. I dive with pipe vine swallow tails down winding stairs, crenulated lava, scrolls fossilized in radiant strata, reed, prickly pear, silver chola, spicules of sponge. Here in this rain shadow's stark flanked gully, Two blue-bellied lizards streak across sand, vanish inside a conch shell. Arrived at the bottom of the world, I write. Buried in the canyon's spiraled larynx, a raft for the coming storm. These, uh, these three pieces I'm going to read are untitled. They're part of a long series. 
Writing from a lone corner of the nation, I no longer recognize the difference between the name of the wall and the wall itself. I write a sound without dimension, an utterance with no one to listen for the radical aspirated roll to the earth's edge where difference ends. The river has concealed itself in dust. With the devil's rotting apples and our flags, I arrange a mosaic of God's face. Exhausted by the work of finding words which never work. My usual worries, a synchronized gesture, a closing door. I have no referent for the polar bend, the Orphic garden, radial descent. I know life by the blurred periphery of its passing, as if it were a train or its caboose, its copper face or tail, a ghost now very far from its body. The waiting room where no one waits opens at the edge of a field. What do you see being rowed across weightless as you are? The earth suspends its one inky eye. I peel back the surface of the water, fish in your blood skimming the blade. Do names, once they lose their bodies, float? Memory is not actual weather. We've already passed through that window. Time is not the passing train, but its passage into absence as we enter the black stream in the gulf's hypoxic canyon. There is no one here to speak back. No clock, no bird, no trees throatless singing. Sewn along the spit, spent casks of wind. Perhaps between the light and its absence is a rival. There is no other room. My silhouette, fossil of the drowned town's scroll, is the glass mind rearranging itself. Is this the poem I must not write? This screen upon which I watch the train move, which is itself a moving screen, each pixel half reflecting my face, half framing a coral's ghostly taxonomy. The sea in between, concealing its quiet transition to death. Fluorescence, bleach. The sea will forget everyone. The names I have kept, names I have banished. I trace the turquoise curve for a window, for that vast humming field, its tunneling dark, where I race against your ghost, where I vanish. Mado, thank you. Over to you, Jesse. It's interesting to uh, ha continue to uh, host when one becomes so moved from <laughs> what one is experiencing. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm honored to have you with us, both with us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we now will uh, bring you Laylee Long Soldier and Jennifer Forster in conversation. Uh, Laylee and Jen, um, You've each worked with the idea of synthesis in various ways in your recent work, and I'll let you weave that in or not as you have your conversation, um, which I'm going to uh, start off with this question. How does a poem unfold for you? Are you aware of something that you are trying to understand or illuminate for yourself or for your readers? 
or is this revealed through the process of writing? Over to you, Laylee and Jen. <laughs> Hi, Laylee. Great to see you. Hi, Jen. It's good to see you too. <laughs> get to talk. Mm -hmm. Same about, here. Yeah, about progress too. You're, you're oh, seeing that work is always inspiring and reminds me to consider all the other forms we can make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> start with the response to the question? Or... Um, well, the question for me, I mean, I can respond to the question. I know there's something that I have been thinking about today that I felt was something that um, would be interesting or fun to talk to you about given yeah. our uh, shared background. But quickly, I will respond to the question. Not to, I don't want to brush it aside. But um, as far as process goes and unfolding of a poem, generally, I, um, I do not have a preconceived idea of what I want to happen in a poem or with a poem. I mean, I feel like I try to learn as much from the poem as I put into it. And mm -hmm. so it ends up often, I feel happiest when a piece ends up in a place I hadn't expected, when mm -hmm. I myself am surprised um, by that. I guess I c we can have you respond to that. And there was what, one other thing I, I was thinking about today, which maybe we could talk about yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, yeah, I, similarly, I, I don't have an idea of what's going to happen with any poem. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in the aspect of the question of unfolding, how a poem unfolds. And, and to think about the poem as something of, that can be folded or unfolded. Um, and also the word synthesis. So those two things I thought I, you know, I had some ideas about. And one is that um, I think my, I think I, I, synthesis is really what I, a technique. Um, and for me, it's about gathering materials, phrases, images, words, um, and gathering them without any judgment of what they might be or what they might be about or what they could speak to, but just gathering them as if it's jewels that I'm going to make a necklace out of or something. And then poems get built from that heap pile um, in my notebooks. And the poems are built out of putting words and phrases and images together that I think um, that synthesize. Um, and that synthesis of, for me, I realized that I have this core concern of synthesis in relation to the natural world. And even saying the natural world, I, I always feel strange about as if it's a world that's not us, that we're not a part of it, that it's a separate thing. And I'm always thinking about that sense of separation in the body, in the tree, in the air, in the water, and how much we are synthesized. Um, but the mind can distract us from that, from feeling that the root, feeling the river. Uh, so that's always my core concern. And I think poems come out of that. They always lean into that concern. I, I build things that somehow resonate with that interest. And what I guess one more thing about the folding um, in process and I think I've told you about this lately, but um, the book that'll be coming out in next year, um, I was created out of folding and unfolding. Some of the poems were, where I had a lot of words on several pages of text and I didn't judge them at all. I just put them there, I just filled the pages with text. And then I ended up folding them literally into, you know, 16 pieces per page. And then I had 64 pieces all together. Maybe my math is wrong. I, it's been so long since I did it. And then once I folded them, then I cut along all the creases and then I had these little squares and I repatched them together like in different quilts. 
and then poems had to come out of each of those pages. So in that case, folding was actually how I, how I constructed the poem. I think that's beautiful because it reminds me of something that I always go back to, uh, the idea that poesis, actually the root of that word, uh, and there's several, there's different translations, but one of the translations is really just to make. And so poesis really is to make something. <laughs> we are making something and we are, and it is, and it can be a very physical process. And some of us, are, I think at least me, I really respond to that. Well, you know, I like to be able to touch something. I like to be able to feel it, to fold it. You know, uh, as you saw in the piece, the star, I like to twist the wires. I like to sit for hours and think and, uh, you know, or shuffle words, as you said, you know, to or to gather. Gather is such a beautiful kind of action or motion to do, to gather your information or things you've collected gather them together and put them on the page and see what happens, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I always return to that idea because I think there's a sort of uh, a, I think it's a romantic idea of poetry just flowing from the soul <laughs> mm -hmm. or something, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't think that's it. I heard you, you talk, you use the language to build a poem to build it, to construct it, you know, and to make, you know, we're making something. And so I, I think that that is an exciting thing to be a part of, you know, when discussing process, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love the word flow. And I always imagine what it would be like for a poem to just flow out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brain onto the paper. It doesn't happen, but I do feel, in the in the writing and in the constructing and moving things around when you're really focused when i'm really focused that's when i feel a flow but it's it's you know it, there's still the construction that's happening i would say i would say uh maybe on that note in fact i was talking about this the other day in another conversation about let's say flow, I mean, it makes me think of energy. And in terms of uh, someone asked, I was with a group of other poets and someone asked a question about feminism, for example. Uh, and they wanted to know our views on that. Uh, and some, I, for some reason that was connected to poetry. <laughs> but I, what I talked about too is also the idea of energy and flow and I said you know there's I there's many ways I could respond to a question like that but one thing that I have been thinking about a lot is energy and when I am most when I feel most alive when I feel my energy is flowing the 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 purest and the cleanest I don't know how to explain it but it is when I'm making something, when I am creative. And even in that space, I might even go so far as to say I feel like in that space, I'm even free of ideas or feelings of gender. You might say, I just feel like I am uh, present. I am a being, you know, and it's, but it is in making, in that energetic, in that uh, creative place, uh, whether it's writing or or art, or what have you. Um, yeah, yeah. Those are such precious moments. I mean, that's what I that's what I wait for and write for, is when I disappear mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. the yeah, it disappear. Yeah, like my my body is completely my body is involved in it, and I feel the the movement. But my concerns, the thoughts I have, are so merged with the feelings that I'm working with, and. I don't know, there's even no way to articulate the separation of self and idea yes. at that moment. And then when you come out of it, it is, gosh, it feels good, you know? Yes. <laughs> that's, the, that's the process of creating and it's a magic thing. It's a magic thing. It looks I like agree. our time is 
it looks like mm -hmm. our time is up so fast already. I know. <laughs> we could talk all night about this, Jennifer. <laughs> we should meet afterwards. Meet <laughs> afterwards. The idea you had earlier today, I want to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Bring you back for one of our year-round JLF conversations, which JLF Colorado conversations, which will give you more time because it's kind of painful to interrupt the conversation there. That was unbelievably powerful and uplifting, which is fascinating as, as you are seeking so deep and expressing so much sorrow and mourning for the past, whether it's your culture's past, the world's past, um, and yet there's this uplifting, alive energy in processing that in the present and in the creative process of um, just being human and sharing, sharing truth with us. So thank you so, so, so very much. It was an honor and very, very beautiful. So. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available through the Boulder Bookstore within the USA. They can ship all over the country and through Full Circle within India. Please do follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay apprised of upcoming sessions. Also, stay tuned to our website at jlflitfest.org forward slash Colorado for the full schedule and information about our speakers. In these unusually difficult times, we have struggled to bring you JLF Colorado without charging a registration fee. If you can donate as generously as you are able to JLF Colorado to ensure a free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge, we would greatly appreciate it and be able to come back live in 2021. <clears throat> Once again, we would like to thank all of our official partners. And we hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll tune in for our next session. In conversation with Jenny Bott at 7 p.m. MST, 9 p.m. EST, 6 p.m. PST, 7.30 a.m. IST. Thank you once again, everybody. And now we present a reading in our break by Elika Mero from the Jaipur Writer Shorts series. Thank you. Port Wine Stained Bird Mark by Elika Mero. I was born with a bought wine stained birthmark. I embrace my difference of appearance in a world of people who pretend that normal is a bliss. No curiosity or concern worries me a day. Of the map drawn on the right side of my face, for I know issues graveyard than the stain on my vascular skin. I want to let know it is not a disease nor an abnormality in any way. And I thank God every day for who I am. The fiction in my mind tells me I am a warrior, recognizable even without having my name known. I notice nothing but the core of myself, comfortable and confident of how I look. Yes, the Pope Weinstein tell me. It makes me wonder the way I am perceived by the world, for through their eyes I see my reflection. I feel the stare of new faces and I know why. Oh, how I wish to let no being different is just fine. Some see this a strawberry or a ripe Kashmiri apple on my face. I only love it all love without a tinge of hurt. After all, it is just my birthmark. But would you be amused if I share with you of how it fluctuates? Dark when I'm cold, light when I'm warm. 
the fresh breeze on my face. It gives me strength and confidence. Teaches me to accept any differences inside out. For I heard of heroes perfectly irregular. You might call my mock a perfect flow. But a flow is not how I hold it. It is a part of me. It is me. Yes, I was born with a Port Weinstein birthmark. <laughs> I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life to join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science of the joys of poetry and music the consolations of philosophy the sense of literature and of life much about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that People at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Work Arts, bringing India to the world, the world to India, through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Team Work Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers, and literary agents. 
work arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavor of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, Festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzy. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts – Celebrating the Arts For more information visit www.teamworkarts.com A festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. and. Um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. 
literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions.